Hello and welcome back to a brand new episode of the Pick Aside podcast. Today's episode is a exclusive one. It's the first time that we've ever recorded an episode right after the games happen. You see Dell's right here. God is saying, Gria. Super wild car weekend. <laughs> what we just witnessed was a very su- superb moment. And I just want to ask you guys, before we get into these games, how has your day been? How's your weekend been? Uh, uh, my day is great. You know, today was a great day. Uh, this is like our first time recording from home after a game. A little bit of something new. So I think this is definitely cool. Something good for the fans. But I had a great day. I think today's games was really cool, especially the last one. Um, just nice to see young quarterbacks, fresh quarterbacks be in the playoffs. Great day, man. Only two of us on the podcast. Drew isn't here, but only two of us are two and zero today. You know, Riv, <laughs> you, you've got the Jags. Uh, it was a little, you know, a little iffy that first half. I was tweeting some stuff I might regret, but uh, great day, man. Great day of football. Even that Seahawks game we'll get into a little bit was good for the first three quarters or so until it turned to a blowout. But great day, man. Got my sangria, enjoying myself, and a great night. So yeah. I, I don't think I would be doing this podcast justice if we went in order of how the games went, you know, because we know the Seahawks and the Niners played first, but we just all finished watching the Jaguars and Chargers game. And I think that's what, that's what everybody wants to hear us talk about. So let's start with them first. The Jaguars beat the Chargers 31 to 30. And what's funny about this game is that if you would have told me before it happened that the Jaguars would win 31 to 30, I would say, okay, you know, that sounds like, a score that would happen, but the way that it happened, I wouldn't have believed anybody. Trevor Lawrence, four interceptions in the first half. You can say two of them weren't his fault. One was batted at the line. The second one was on on a fourth down. And I I thought Doug Peterson probably should have just went for the field goal on, on that one. But first half, Trevor Lawrence, horrible. Second half, four touchdowns comes to life. We saw that fourth and one play by Doug Peterson that he cooked up uh, to give it an 18 on the outside, and that set them up perfectly in field goal range, a chip shot, and they end up winning the game. And, and my thoughts from, from this game really is just, I'm not surprised because this just feels like how the Chargers would lose a game. It just, I, I'm not even shocked by it because the Chargers just lose games like this all the time. But also, it's over for Brandon Staley. Like he's he's not going to be the head coach. He I wouldn't be surprised if he gets fired tonight. And granted, his defense did collapse in the second half. I, I thought Justin Herbert had an underwhelming game by his standards. I, I thought Herbert, I was expecting more out of him. In, in in those drives at the end of the game where you need the Chargers to do something, he was unable to generate first downs. And for the entire game, Herbert wasn't phenomenal he wasn't Justin Herbert and the allure attached to his name it wasn't really there I I mean the Chargers scored 17 or 20 points off of Trevor Lawrence's turnovers it's not like Herbert was leading them down the field and scoring and and to me I I thought Herbert was kind of underwhelming he was not only that but he had an average depth of target around six average yards per completion around four I mean, they weren't really pushing the ball downfield as much. Part of that has to do with that being Mike, without Mike Williams being there. We talked about that on the podcast. It seemed like leading up to the game, there was a decent chance he was going to play. It came out, I think, yesterday or possibly the day before that he ended up you know, not going to be able to make it. And it, it had a big impact. They were not able to push the ball down the field as much. Um, it felt like there were times where you know that deep threat was missing because you have guys like DeAndre Carter, who uh, I think ended up missing or going out uh, you know, halfway through the game, Keen Allen, more possession type guy. Same thing with Gerald Everett, who had a great game as well. But missing Mike Williams being your primary deep threat, the ability to stretch the field. Um, you know, we saw that from Jacksonville. We saw that big play to Marvin Jones that got them that touchdown. Trevor Lawrence did a great job adjusting at the line of scrimmage. Big play over the top gets for that touchdown. It is important, especially when you're making that comeback, to be able to get those cheap shots. I call them cheap, but those quick plays down the field to get you points quick when you're down 27-0 at halftime. You're going to have to get a couple of those to get back into that game. I mean, Trevor Lawrence, everyone calls him generational. He's a generational prospect. This is a generational game. This is the reason you draft Trevor Lawrence number one overall. This is the reason he has all of this hype because he could do stuff like this. I know in college, you know, he came up short every once in a while. I mean, he had one or two losses in college career, one of them being a college championship, but he did win a college championship too. We knew this is possible, right? His first time being in the playoffs, being this game, this type of victory is something that, 
very few. Of, I mean, this is the first time any first time quarterback did in the playoffs. It's sensational. It, it's something a veteran type move from Trevor Lawrence in his first playoff game. I think for me, um, just like watching the game, you, you notice the offense for the Chargers wasn't really impressive. You know, they didn't really make too much of a difference. I think the defense for the Chargers, especially in the first half, they just seemed like they were physically more imposing. They were a lot more aggressive with the Jaguars, and they just looked like they were punking them out there. You know, they they were making a lot of big plays. And you mentioned it, those interceptions, you know, you look at the grand scheme of the interceptions, you're going to say those were his fault. But if you really watch the game, two of them really weren't his fault. One of them was really bad. I think he was he – was, uh, one guy was coming off a drag and he just threw it. He didn't notice the cornerback was just sitting there. So like he had some bad interceptions, but I think like the chargers, you know, the way the offense was moving, like you mentioned, Staley's gone. I think that's best case scenario. You wanted him okay. going to place. So, but the offense just like, you, you mentioned it. We thought this game would be a goodie. We thought this game would be a back and forth, but we didn't think they would go down 27 and then come back like that. I mean, the way the Jacksonville Jaguars just – Doug Peterson continued to call the game the same way. He did not budge throughout the whole game. He made impressive play after impressive play. The way Trevor Lawrence bounced back in the second half, Travis Etienne, the receivers are making big-time throws. I mean, this game – like, I, and I remember even when I was in the Discord, they were down 30 to, what, 24 or something like that, and I said, go for it. They called me stupid for saying to go for it, take the field goal, and then it works in the end. Like, it was just such a – such a great story for the Jaguars, but for the Chargers, man, for the defense to play so well in that first half and then just collapse like that in the in the second half and the offense not getting anything going. It sucks for Justin Herbert because this is like his first time there. And this is like the team, you know, this is a cursed team. So it really does suck for the Chargers. Yeah. And, and I was watching the game with my daddy. You know, you know, even though the Jaguars were down, I was saying, listen, dad, the Jaguars have a quarterback. His name is Trevor Lawrence. And he's damn good. And he's damn good. And he can come back, and he's very clutch. Uh, you know, there's been very few moments where he hasn't been that. Sick. You can count it on one <laughs> hand. Well, you and, counted you know, that, but you tweeted you it out. Not. Actually, <laughs> you counted them and tweeted it. Me. Photoshop, my bad. You know, I, I, t I told, I told them. I, I replied to my tweet, and I said, "Yeah, I gotta stop photoshopping my tweets, man. <laughs> yeah, I gotta stop <laughs> photoshopping my crazy. tweets." Now it's funny because, it, um, for one, I thought the Jaguars are dead in the water. You know, obviously, I'm just, I was just joking there. And Trevor Lawrence, yeah, there was a moment there where I'm like, okay, is this, like, going to start being a narrative, you know, where he is just being labeled a choker? Because I remember 2020 against LSU, he wasn't that good in college, granted. 2021 in the Sugar ever. Bowl, Justin Fields, six touchdowns to two touchdowns. And I thought week 18, Josh Dobbs outplayed him. And this game, I mean, having four interceptions in the first half, no Great. other quarterback has done that since this quarterback named I have it here. I actually wrote it down. His name is um Gary Danielson. I don't even know what era he played. But yeah, four interceptions in the first half. It was trending towards an, an all time Trevor Lawrence bad moment. And then he finishes off with four touchdowns and four interceptions. The first player, I mean the set the second player to do that since Big Ben. So yeah, I mean, there was definitely a moment there where I was like, man, Trevor Lawrence. Is this is this we the know. narrative now? <laughs> we know, we know. And before we even go any further, shout out to my beautiful girlfriend Chelsea, who's with me right now for this layout we have right now. She was one to put us together. Um, but you, Trevor, Trevor, clap it up, clap it up. Yeah, I, I don't uh, have the applause sound with me. <laughs> <laughs> Trevor Lawrence had a, he had a great quote after the game. Uh, the reporter asked him like, "Oh, how'd you how'd you overcome this four interceptions? Like, how do you get your mind right?" He said, "We have no other choice. You know, this is the only no. other option we had." Right? He went out there. He's a guy who obviously coming into the NFL, being with Jacksonville, being with Urban Meyer, I mean, it, it doesn't get worse than that, especially coming from Clemson, which is one of the best run programs in college football, a team that he wasn't losing college games ever. Like he has two losses, I want to say, on his college resume. Like he had uh, he had an interview, I believe, before the season, maybe during the season, saying like how much of an adjustment it was coming from high school. He never lost a game. College lost one or two. Coming into the NFL, being the worst team last year. He was not used to losing. So the fact that he's able to have that season last year, completely throw that away. We've seen what he's doing in the second half of the season, now bringing into the playoffs this year. And just to talk about the charge a little bit, I tweeted out, in the long run, might be best case scenario. We talked about it on the show. We didn't think Brandon Staley would get fired. But if they lost this game in embarrassing fashion, I think most of us thought if they got blown out, not they blow a lead, there's a chance he gets fired. Coaches have got fired for a lot less than this. You know what I mean? Like, they, I understand they got to the playoffs. They've been progressing each year. 
But you got Sean Payne. Sean Payne's out there on the market. And as much as the rumors to Denver and Arizona and all of this, you look at this Chargers team. If I'm Sean Payton, I want to go here. This is the team I want to go to. I have Justin Herbert. I don't have to worry about Russell Wilson fixing him, paying his contract. I don't have to worry about an injured Kyler Murray with Arizona. Houston is a mess, number one, uh, number two overall pick, but a mess. I could go to the Chargers, have a top four quarterback in the league, Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, a, a talented group on defense. I know you know they have some, some misses for sure, um, or some weaknesses, I should say, but this is a great spot for Sean Payne if they decide to move up Brandon Staley. Um, you know, obviously being a somewhat new ownership ownership group in the Chargers, I, I almost expect it. The fact that you have a, a Super Bowl winning head coach out there being, you know, have a chance to go out and get him. I'm looking forward to a man. If Sean Payne and Herbert get together, that's going to be a nasty, nasty combination. So the Chargers were up 27 to 7 in the first half. They were outscored 24 to 3 in the second half. And in the first half, I thought that Brandon Staley had a really great game plan. And had it not been for that collapse, we would be here praising his defensive game plan because they sat on a lot of the Jaguars routes. They didn't expect that they didn't respect any deep threat. And because of that, we saw that the Jaguars often struggled in the second half. That wasn't really the case. So Brandon Staley was trending towards having a great defensive performance and really showcasing and telling everybody that, you know, I should still be a head coach, but when you you mentioned it perfectly, and I think you made a great point, this was best case scenario for the Chargers. Them blowing this lead, them getting embarrassed in this fashion was best case scenario because now Brandon Staley is fired. The same guy that played Mike Williams in week 18 that caused them to get injured and miss this wild card game, which he would have definitely made a difference in. Yep. If, if I'm Sean Payne, I look at Denver. Yeah, it's a good situation, right? You got some pieces in place, but is Russell Wilson fixable or has he regressed? And even if Russell Wilson is great, he's not Justin Herbert. You look at Arizona, and I think those are the two viable options for Sean Payne, Arizona and Denver. Arizona, Kyler Murray is injured right now, ACL. The Chargers are the best situation. And if Sean Payton goes and coaches the Chargers, he's bringing Vic Fangio, who the defense Brandon Staley runs is the same that Vic Fangio runs. So there's not going to be much transition from that regime to Sean Payton's, but now the offense is going to be way better. So I think best case scenario was not having Justin Herbert bail you out of this type of game because it was only going to mask the problems that exist within the Chargers. It was better to, okay, for the problems to blow up in your face how it did, the offense being stagnant, the depth of target, that's something I've spoke about a lot at length last year and how, yeah, the, the Chargers' offensive numbers may look great, but it's because of Herbert, not because of Lombardi. You now get Lombardi out the door. You get Staley out the door. And now you start with Sean Payne, a Super Bowl winning head coach with Justin Herbert. That duo can go very far in the AFC West. Yeah. And in you, the you, AFC in general. You talked about it. You know, just unfortunately, you obviously want to win the game, you know, but you get Brandon Staley. I, I think it's, you know, bringing in a coach. And I, I do think the Chargers need a, a bit better weapons. On the outside, I think Keenan Alley, as great as he is, Mike Williams, you need other guys, you know, speedsters, guys that can break you down. But I also think, like, watching this game with Sean Payton, like, Justin Herbert, Russell Wilson, Kyler Murray, Herbert is clearly the most talented out of all three of them. I think you can make the argument Herbert is better than Russell Wilson ever was, as great as he is, because Herbert is that type of dude, and he's only, like, 24, 25 years old. So coming into this situation, you got a young quarterback – who's a top five quarterback in the league. He's young. He's fresh. He still has a lot to learn as great as he is. That's just a better option than a guy who is hurt. Still K1 still has questions as a leader, still can't see the middle of the field. And Russell Wilson has these same issues as K1 yet. He's much older. So yeah, the chargers, if I'm Sean Payne, you've been with Drew Brees your whole life, you know, winning, you got to understand I'm, I'm about to go play with Justin Herbert, who is a monster of men when it comes to quarterback and one of the best in the game. And I just want to say, Chargers fans, it sounds rude that we say it's just a Chargers way to lose in this fashion. Trust me, when I had my 0-5 Jets rant, people in the comments were saying, it's the Jets, they'll find a way to go 0-5 and, and blow it, right? It feels the same way about the Chargers, and it, it seems like an easy thing to say, but it's just the same thing over and over and over again. And 
the way to overcome that is one, have a great quarterback. You have that. And number two, have a great head coach. Brandon Staley, decent head coach. He doesn't seem like to be an elite type guy that's ever going to climb into, you know, that top five of the coaching of the head coaches in the league. Sean Payne, on the other hand, he's already been there, experienced, won the Super Bowl. If you want to get over this, the Chargers are just going to be the Chargers hump. You bring in Sean Payton to go up with Justin Herbert. I think that gets going out the window. And I think, you know, the, the thing with the Chargers, though, is that they lose in this fashion, but they've had great quarterbacks. Phillip Rivers, it's true. It's Justin true. Herbert. I'm forgetting the quarterback, the old time. They had great players. Um, they had, they had Fouts, for a couple of years. Yeah, yeah, Dan Fouts was an amazing quarterback. So, you know, they Herbert's have. the best at all of them. Yeah, they have these pieces in place, but p- these pieces they in place, but they all still time lose. tight ends, all time running backs. Antonio like, Gates, LT. There was a year yeah, they had bro. the first ranked offense and defense and didn't make the playoffs because the of their special teams. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah they had the 32nd awesome. ranked special teams that didn't make it. So, you know, the Chargers are used to things like this. Ridiculous. But oh. I think if you're a Jaguars fan, you are feeling very optimistic about this team moving forward. Uh, Evan oh, Ingram yeah. continues to show out and he continues to dominate his mismatch, his mismatches, because he is a wide receiver playing tight end. And, and this was everything you wanted to see stingy defense. The pass rush really came alive late in the game. And I will say, you know, despite. A lot of the tweets that I ranted out off today, uh, the Charger, the I mean, the Jaguars made me a lot of money today. They made me a lot of money. <laughs> I am crying. Yeah, yeah. because there's always, there's always a bet with Joel. Always, like, no, no matter man. what, there's always a bet. So today I placed Chargers minus two and a half spread, right? And when they were up twenty seven to fourteen, I had a cash out option. Uh, and the difference between the cash out on me winning the bet outright was like seven dollars, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to cash out. Like, I, I, I have a feeling the Chargers are going to blow this. And then I took the Jaguars' money line to come back, which was at plus 540 odds. Ooh. I took that. I won. And I took their spread at plus 6.5 at plus 100 odds. I took that. And, um, you know, James Harden, he he got me some money today with the points and assists combo. So always happy <laughs> for James Harden. He's a lot for that. They, they made me a lot of money today, man. The Jaguars, shout out to them because now I'm, I'm 90 bucks richer with, with their bets. Mm-hmm. But this was everything you wanted to see if you were a, a Jaguars fan and Chargers. Even though this is a tough loss, I think the future is, is definitely much brighter now that they lost this game. Transitioning on to the, the first game that happened in the Super Bowl. Uh, let weekend. talk about it. The 49ers and the Seattle Seahawks. Now, first half was very good. First half, it was... I had a feel, a little bit of a feeling. It was a feeling of an upset happening with the Seattle Seahawks. And then the second half, the 49ers just completely dominated the game defensively, offensively. And Brock Purdy, I mean, he continues to have these jaw-dropping number performances. I wouldn't say performances because when you watch them, they're not jaw-dropping. But, you know, give Brock Purdy some respect because this game, I believe he had 332 yards, three touchdowns. And Riv, you're a big, big Brock Purdy fan. I don't think you've gotten out the phase of maybe it's just Kyle Shanahan being a mastermind. <laughs> so, you know, let me know. Let me tell me what you saw from Brock Purdy. Um, You know, it's interesting because this week, this day especially has been all about narrative and story. You know, with Geno Smith, Brock Purdy, Justin Herbert, Trevor Lawrence, a lot of narrative and stories behind it. Watching Brock Purdy, it was a good game. You know, the numbers tell you it was amazing. It wasn't an amazing game, no. In the first half, Brock Purdy was missing some throws. He was missing guys. He was trying to make tight window throws that I just don't think he's ready to do. But I I do think in the second half, you know, you as a like as a Niners fan, I feel like they didn't have any fear because when you have guys like CMC, Kittle, Debo, and then on the defensive end, you got uh, Warner, you got Nick Bosa. When you have those guys and the Seahawks, as good as they are, they don't really have those type of guys. You don't ever really feel that worry. And I think throughout the game, especially in the second half, you saw the game changers started to make plays. But I think for Brock Purdy, you know, he the one thing that always sticks out to me is his confidence. He never lacks confidence. He's always ready to make a big time throw. Maybe it might not, you know, always get to the uh, receiver. Maybe it might be overthrow or underthrow. But one thing about Brock is he's always going to make the throw regardless. And you saw that late in the game in the second half. He made some good throws. Now, I, I know the numbers will tell you, he was amazing. He was not amazing today. I thought he was okay. Like he played solid in the second half. He played a little bit much better, but I think 
having CMC is such a beauty and a blessing for him, for a guy like that, because he's such a check down merchant. And sometimes that's okay being a check down merchant because CMC is a guy that can take those to the house, can take those over the top. And you got guys like Debo that can also take those check downs far. So when you have players like that and then IU, he, him and IU connection was really good today. So I just thought he played okay. You know, I thought the Niners in the second <clears> half <throat> definitely turned it up, but I thought, a lot of good things for the Seahawks, especially DK. You know, he had a great game. He was putting Ward in hell, just absolutely dominating him. But the Niners are a scary team, you know, and Brock Purdy continues to play solid, sound football with the weapons like CMC, Kittle, and guys like Ayuk and Debo. I don't see a team outside of maybe the Eagles that can really stop this team from winning. This ended up being, what, 41-17, I think is the final score. 41-23. Um, 41-23, sorry. Yeah. Um it wasn't it wasn't that much of a blow up. It, it really wasn't. The the first three quarters were really competitive and I tweeted out, it just goes to show you if you want to beat the 49ers, you have to be perfect. The first half, the Seattle Seahawks had no turnovers, no penalties. They were up two points. And the only reason they were up two points was because at the end of the first half, the 49ers defender had a bad um unnecessary roughness penalty on the quarterback when uh, Gino was sliding down, they kicked the field goal, they go up two. Other than that, they probably would have been into halftime winning the game. Playing this 49ers team who just has pro bowlers everywhere, all pros everywhere, guys that can score a touchdown at any point in the field, Kittle, Debo, CMC, it doesn't matter. Mitchell had a touchdown today. I mean, this team is insanely talented, and we're going to go into this offseason with Brock Purdy, and it's going to be interesting because you're going to have people who say, look what he did in the playoffs. I think they'll win another playoff game. I think at minimum they'll go to the NFC Championship game. You're going to have people saying he took you to the NFC Championship game. He played in the system. And ultimately, that's what Shanahan wants. He wants a quarterback that plays in the system. We saw Purdy. You know, he, while he does obviously benefit from having Shanahan, having these weapons, he has good traits. He's decisive. For the most part, he could read defenses. He's pretty accurate. I mean, guys are open, but he's accurate. He's hitting them in stride. So it's easy to say that he's in the perfect situation because he is. But you also look at the positive traits, which is what this coaching staff is going to look at, what Shanahan's going to look at in the offseason. And when they go into training camp in OTAs next season, they're going to be putting that against Trey Lance, who might have this athletic ability, have this big arm and all of this talent. But if he's not going to be able to play in the system like Brock Purdy does, that might be an issue. But just to talk about this game. Well, does we that hurt us? Huh? Does that hurt you? Like, because you're a big. Uh, it guy. hurts. It hurts me a little bit because I, I do think <laughs> Trey Lance will succeed in the system, and I do think ultimately he gets a chance. You don't trade three first round picks and don't give the guy a chance. Um, but just talk about this game a little bit because I'm sure we'll have a, a bunch of 49ers offseason talk in the future. I love the Eagles, man. I love Jalen Hurts. That's going to be a dog fight. The Eagles and 49ers is going to be a dog fight. I do ultimately think that's going to be the NFC Championship game. Shanahan Sirianni that really might come down to the difference you have Shanahan who's been in this position he's been to Super Bowls he obviously hasn't been able to get over that hump loose in the Kansas City and obviously the Falcons game when he was an offensive coordinator he's going to be looking at that and, and taking that you know as fuel to be able to get over that hump and get back to the Super Bowl and ultimately win that game um, so I, I think the 49ers this is just what we're expecting it was a dominant fourth quarter uh, especially once the Seahawks started to get you know, some penalties, you know, Smith had the turnover in the red zone. He had an interception once the game was over. But to beat this 49ers team, you're going to be damn near perfect. I think what's happening with Brock Purdy right now is interesting because it's unprecedented. We haven't seen somebody like Brock Purdy in a long time. A late round pick. I mean, he was the last pick in the draft, Mr. Irrelevant, come in and have so much success. And a lot of the stuff I'm about to read out here is a lot of pro- Brock Purdy propaganda. So there are only four quarterbacks that have 330 yards, four touchdowns, zero interceptions in a uh, playoff game. That's Matt Ryan, Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady. Well, no, not Tom Brady. It was Patrick Mahomes and Brock Purdy. That is elite company. And Brock Purdy is the youngest player in NFL postseason history to throw for 300 yards and three touchdowns. He surpassed Dan Marino, who was his childhood hero, doing so. And if at face value you show everybody these stats, they'll be like, yeah, there's no doubt Brock Purdy is legit. He's the guy. But then you look into the other ones where there was an average of 10 yak yards per completion, 185 yak yards total for the 49ers, and people were running wide open. And it's not a knock on Brock Purdy. Like, okay, he's hitting throws. He's doing his job. 
But at least for me, I look at Kyle Shanahan and think he's one of the best offensive coaches I've ever seen because this is now him like succeeding with a variety of different quarterbacks, different skill sets. We saw it with Robert Griffin III as a rookie. He had a historic rookie season. He always liked Kirk Cousins, but he didn't really get to coach him much. He goes to San Fran, gets Jimmy G. They go 5-0. and He gets hurt. He succeeds with Nick Mullins. They have good stats. When I mean succeed, I don't I don't mean win, but they have good stats. C.J. Beathard had good numbers. And people love to knock Trey Lance and criticize him heavily for that week one Bears game. But last year when Trey Lance started, he had a 95 passer rating. I mean, Trey Lance wasn't bad. And now Brock Purdy succeeding at a similar level and the narrative grows and this kind of aura around him or whether or not he's the next coming of Tom Brady is that's like now a thing with some people. And I, I do think that the locker room is responding to him in a different way. That is going to be hard for Trey Lance to overcome. But ultimately if, if the Niners want Trey Lance to be their guy, he's going to be their guy. And I think Kyle Shanahan knows he can succeed with him if he wants to, but Brock Purdy, I think it's an amazing story. I had the 49ers cakewalk to the NFC championship. I mean, what? They're going to – they beat the Seahawks. That's an easy win. If they face the Vikings next game, I think that's going to be an easy win. It really doesn't matter. You know, the Niners are going to go to the NFC championship, and I think it's going to be the Eagles and the Niners. And, and that's where I feel like Brock Purdy's flaws that kind of don't get talked about enough because they're not showing up on the stat sheet – will get talked about, you know, because there were throws this game where he left it far too too far inside, you know, went to uh, Jawan Jennings where he should have threw it on the outside. He left it too far far inside. It should have been an interception. It wasn't. You know, I get, I get, you know, that you're nitpicking, but that's what the playoffs are. And sometimes I do kind of stop myself from going a bit overboard with Brock Purdy because he's the last pick in the draft, you know, and <laughs> Brock Purdy's the last pick in the draft. But when people start talking about him like he's the second coming of all-time greats, then there has to be a line and there has to kind of be like, okay, you know, this is kind of getting out of hand because nobody's talking about him or putting expectations on him anymore like he's the last pick in the draft. You know, people are saying, no, now they can win the Super Bowl with Brock. And I don't disagree with that because I think he's playing at a level where that can definitely happen. And to talk about the Seahawks a little bit, because we didn't give them much love, they did get blown out. But Geno played a good game, man. Geno Smith against the top defense. And there was a report that came out that he's going to stay with Seattle most likely or probably play under the franchise tag. And I like that, man. And I like that because Seattle gave him his chance to come back in his career. And I think, it, you know, obviously everything for the right price, but I just love him staying in Seattle and, just making sure this relationship doesn't end because this is ultimately where the revival of his career started. So I like that a lot. And, and the Seahawks have a bright future. They have the Broncos pick, but the 49ers is just too good. Broncos pick. My only question is like, cause we've, so we're not going to mention Nick Mullins, CJ Bethard. We're going to really just specifically talk about Lance, Jimmy G and uh Purdy more Purdy versus Jimmy G. Cause Lance, obviously he went down with an injury. But my thing is, like, we Purdy only has a one-game sample size, and it's against the Seahawks, so it's really hard to manage. But we watched Jimmy G in the postseason a lot not be utilized the way Brock Purdy was utilized in the passing game, I feel like. I feel like Kyle Shanahan trusted Purdy a lot more to make throws in the pocket, to make more risky throws. And I think that goes to show Purdy's confidence and his ability a little bit. And with Jimmy G – Shanahan relied more on the running game. So, and even that's that's even with CMC. Like, I feel like they never had a running back as good as CMC. CMC is kind of the best running back they've had. So my question is, like, Jimmy G went to the Super Bowl, right? But he wasn't really making many throws. He never really had – like, they were winning games. He was making – like, he was throwing, like, 80 yards a game. With this, do you see maybe an opportunity that where, even though Brock Purdy, like, like you said, he goes to play the Eagles in the NFC Championship – do you really see a situation where some of those flaws could harm him? Because a lot of the times he makes plays that Jimmy G couldn't make. And that's that was what we used to say. We used to say this Niners team would be held back because Jimmy G couldn't make those throws. But Brock Purdy, to a degree, can. Yeah, I think I, more than anything, it's his mobility. Sorry, Joel, to cut you off. Um, I think his mobility more than anything stands out, right? Jimmy G 
has some mobility, right? But Brock Purdy, I mean, you saw the play to IU that ultimately he dropped, but that's a play Jimmy G doesn't make. That's a play that he's really not capable of because his mobility is just not the same as Brock Purdy. And the only thing I'll say about, about Purdy is if he's able to get past the Eagles, right, I think that that opens a whole new conversation, right? If he's able to get past them and they go to the Super Bowl, regardless if they win or not, I think the fact that if he's able to beat them, that Eagles team who's been the best team all season, a top defense, although they're, they're going through some injuries right now, and obviously Jalen Hurts, who before you know going down to injury was a leading MVP candidate, him and Mahomes are one and two. However, you might have had it. I had Hurts. Other people, non-ball ball knowers, had Mahomes. Um, but but anyway, <laughs> but anyway, I think if Purdy does that, it opens uh, it opens up new questions because right now he's doing more or less what Gar- Garoppolo does, right? I mean, obviously his stat line like today, three hundred thirty yards, three touchdowns, like. You know, this is something that Jimmy G has not done in the playoffs. I mean, last year's um, game against the Packers is the one that sticks out, a game that they, you know, they ultimately won, but it was like, uh, I don't know. I mean, that wasn't a game that you're looking at Jimmy G being there, the reason they won. I know you went to Lambeau, it was shitty weather, whatever, but I mean, the Packers scored one offensive touchdown, right? And that was the first drive of the game, I want to say. So I do think there is to a degree levels for the 49ers. Like, okay, Brock Purdy right now, like, he has the potential to be our starting guy next year, but if he really wants to impress this coaching staff, although he has already for sure, but if he really wants to not cement himself, but be a legitimate candidate, it's go above and beyond, be able to be at the number one seeded Eagles, be able to outplay Jalen Hurts, get past this top level defense. And then the Super Bowl is icing on the cake. Um, so I think the 49ers who have been in a very weird quarterback situation forever, it seems like, right? Even if you go back to the Alex Smith, Colin Kaepernick days, where it's like you kind of had a similar situation with Purdy and Trey Lance, where Kaepernick was the more explosive guy, the guy who has higher upside. You had Alex Smith, who was more the guy who fits in the system. Ultimately, uh, Harbaugh at the time went on with Colin Kaepernick, had some success in the playoffs, you know, uh, came up short in the Super Bowl. It's kind of the same situation all over again with Trey Lance and Brock Purdy. Obviously, Lance isn't able to come back this season, but next year it's going to be the same situation going into the 2023 season. Do I go with the guy with the more upside? Do I go with the guy who plays in the system? Um, so Purdy, like I like I mentioned, if he's able to get past the Eagles, it opens up more questions, and potentially we could talk about him being the starter for multiple seasons. Yeah, I think, and just I just want to say this one quick thing, and then you could do your thing, Joel. I do think like the way Purdy is playing, this definitely opens the door for the fact that. I don't see a world where Jimmy G needs to come back. You know, I think he's also a free agent. So like he's not, think, you know what I mean? Cause I know they've been really wanting the Jimmy G to come back. You know, he's a good backup and stuff. But I think with Purdy being as good as he is now, this opens up the door where it's like, all right, we have direct Purdy who's more than capable of being a backup, even if he doesn't start to where we don't need to really keep Jimmy G. Now he's even more expendable than he was before. Yeah. For me, I, I kind of pushed back on the trusting Brock Purdy more. Because he had 185 yards of yak. When we saw Debo Samuel take a touchdown to the house on a, on a slant. They have some of the best yak guys in the game. So no yes, matter who's that, it, no matter who's it, that but, quarterback, you're going to have Debo yak. hit the charge. Yes, like, he was yes. slowing yes. down. The fuck? Yeah, bro. Like, yeah, there's no doubt. But then at the same time, you have to say, you have to look at matchups. And when you when the 49ers faced the Green Bay Packers the first time in 2019, you didn't need to pass because Raheem Moser did everything and they were getting 10 yards every run play. So I think that game script matters. And in this game, at first they weren't running the ball very well, but then CMC broke off that big time run. And, and then, you know, there was a lot of play action stuff. And, you know, Brock Purdy was thrown into open space and then guys would just get a ton of yak. So I do think that the 330 yards is a bit inflated. You know, you can't count on 185 yak yards a game. You know, that really just means that wherever you're throwing, there's no defender in the vicinity of that area. Or if you're Debo, sometimes you break a couple tackles and, you know, you you go for more. <laughs> but, you know, that's I, I feel like Brock Purdy's doing a job and he's doing it very well. But I don't think people should get in over their heads about the job that he's doing. But isn't that what Shanahan wants? A quarterback who does a job to an extent? I mean, I you, you trade up for yeah, Lance, sure. which makes me think you want someone who does more than a job, but there's also all those rumors out here that said they want Mac Jones, who is the definition of a guy who's just going to do a job and do it really well. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, but I'm more so speaking to the crowd that thinks Brock Purdy is more than what he is uh, giving out right now. You know, people- He's think great he's... in the perfect system. Yeah, 
and I think that's fine. But people are also reacting to it a bit. You know, we'll see, you know, how he comes up when we look at him play against one of these top defenses, these top teams, and we'll see, you know, how he does. But I will say, you know, I'm a big Brock Purdy fan. I have a lot of money invested to him on Mojo. <laughs> I was going to say, you're not really a Brock Purdy fan. I don't know where you're going and with I, this. And today, and today, now, I have duplicate accounts. So for people that are listening, I have duplicate accounts. So Mojo has given me the uh, privilege of having an account where I trade like it's real money, but I can't really cash out on it. And I built that portfolio from 10000 to 20000 And at the start of today, it was at 19000 It's at 23000 right now. Brock Purdy... It went from an eight thousand dollar investment to he, I think he's like seventeen thousand dollars now. He's went up a crazy amount. But Mojo recently gave me a bonus of a hundred dollars uh, right. to 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 play around with on my real account where you know it's actually it's actual real money. And I put in a hundred dollars on Brock Purdy today. He went up fifty percent. That one hundred dollars at one hundred fifty four dollars. So and I told you, Drew. I told all you guys. To put money in Brock, because like I said, I think there's going to be a cakewalk to the NFC Championship. That's two good games right there. He had his first one. Now we'll see how good he does next game. But but yeah, you know, this uh, this is a really great opportunity for him. And, you know, a good way to also cash in on his value right now because he's at eight dollars and that's not even starting quarterback level uh, in um, investment. It's not. Yeah, I just and shout out Mojo. I uh, sorry, real quick, cut you off. I did it on the show live. I invested one hundred twenty four dollars. I I looked at my Mojo account today. I'm up sixty dollars on Brock Purdy, just yeah. like that. You know, so it, and they're also doing a special, right? Eight X for the the playoffs. I want to say it was Normally for Trevor two- Lawrence. <laughs> oh, it was for Trevor. Okay, I got you. That hey, that would have got in you in the first bad. half. It was looking rough. That would have got yeah, that, yeah, facts. But you would have got. You know, uh, Mojo ain't sent me my hundred dollars, so I'm gonna have to call my boy to the uh, lock. Yeah, I talk but, to um, about that. Yeah, yeah but um. Nah, yeah, I think, but I think like the Niners, the beauty of the Niners is like the Niners, they'll Purdy will always be in a perfect situation. And I think sometimes it's like they'll always be at the top of the NFC for the most part. They'll always have the coach, the perfect offensive weapons. So it's like, even though he may not be doing a little too much, because sometimes you need a quarterback to do a little bit too much to get you a W. The system in the Niners is so beautiful, and the guys that they build around, like you got Debo, you got CMC, you got Kittle, and then you got Ayuk. It's like that's a four-headed dragon. Not many teams in the NFC, especially the NFC. Like if this was the AFC, I get it. You need you need one of them guys, but in the NFC, you know, we got some guys, young guys that's not gonna be at that level yet. And then we got all the old guys like Brady, Aaron Rodgers, they don't have the same teams anymore. So it's like Purdy may not have to do too much at the moment just because the NFC is so weak. He can just kind of run with the yak yards, let the guys beat him, and then <laughs> carry him to the Super Bowl. Now, if you were to describe what you witnessed today in one word, what would it be? What would the word be? Sensational. Generational. Sensational. Generational. I'm going mean, to go real simple and say wild. Wild specs. Yeah, it was crazy game. I mean, the Seahawks game, whatever, kind of became a blowout. But this is one of the best playoff games we've ever seen. Jags, that comeback, 27-0. I mean, the first half was just like the Chargers were playing at a different pace. The Chargers were getting to the ball fast. Like, everything was open for the Chargers. Nothing was going right for the Jaguars. The fact that they had such a crazy turnaround in the second half, it really goes to show how great of a coach Doug Peterson is, how great Trevor Lawrence is. They're going to get smoked by the Chiefs. They're going to lose to the Chiefs. Um, but next year with Calvin Ridley, get some moves, you know, in the in free agency and the draft. Obviously, the future is very bright for the Jacks. Yeah, I think, like, for me, like, this year has been, like, so fun for me because I've watched so much more football than I've usually watched. And, like, you know, today watching the games and being so invested, like, I was so, like, just excited to see that go, like, because I made the tweet. I'm like, yo, Jaguars are going to go on a generational run. Just watch it. And then they go do the shit, like, watching it bar for bar, how it happens. I was like, this storyline was made so perfectly to happen, and it just had to be on the Chargers. And I feel so bad that it had to be them because nothing ever <laughs> was them. It's really crazy. Never, never. Today, I, I just hope tomorrow – it's, it's just so much better or just as good if not because i know we got the vikings and we got um the vikings and the giants we got another game i forgot i think the bills play tomorrow too but that vikings and the giants game i hope they give us a complete master class because we need it we'll be back here tomorrow night recapping the three wild card games that are going to happen 
Uh, I know that Dells will be here. Drew will be here. Not sure what Riff's plans look like. I'm, no, I'll be here. I'm so here. He'll be here. Oh, so it'll, here? Be, it'll right. be the four of us tomorrow night recapping this game. You know, wish Drew would have been here to explain to us how Justin Herbert shut the doubters up with his all-time great performance. <laughs> but yeah, you know, it was a very good wildcard weekend. Just going to do it. Make sure you guys like this video, and we'll be back here tomorrow.